Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, I want to read a couple of portions <coughs> Excuse me. together. Uh, we've been looking at, at uh, that little thought uh, from Proverbs where the Lord says, My son, uh, give me thine heart. And uh, we were looking at the Lord, not giving the Lord not only our heart, but how the Lord can take our heart and what he can do with that heart and how he can bless it indeed. We've already looked at, that he can exchange it they can take our heart from being a, a heart of sin and a heart of our own nature and our own self 
and he can put a new work within our hearts and within our lives and change us around so he can uh, certainly exchange that heart. And as we move on uh, this morning, there's another couple of things from Ezekiel chapter 36. First and foremost, I want to read, and this was a little portion <coughs> excuse me, that we were looking from. Ezekiel 36, and then we'll read from verse 25 uh, down to verse 30. And I want then to turn to Galatians chapter 5. And I want to read there uh, the fruit of the Spirit and how we were looking here at the Spirit and what the Spirit can do for us and how that he produces fruit in our lives this morning, God willing. Uh, so Ezekiel 36, first of all, and then verse 25 uh, there uh, together. Ezekiel 36, verse 25 says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. And finishing there at verse 30, and just turning over then to Galatians chapter 5, there in the New Testament. <clears throat> First and second Corinthians, and then you have the book of Galatians. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 16 of the chapter there together, uh, down to the end, verse 26. And in the midst of this, you have the fruit of the Spirit. And it says in verse 16 of Galatians 5, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And we do thank the Lord for the reading, <coughs> excuse me, of his precious word. And we trust to be a blessing to us. And a little later on as we bring a few thoughts uh, from that little portion together.
Let's just bow together for a short word of prayer before we turn to God's word. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you afresh this morning for the privilege we have of gathering together in your name. We thank you now for the privilege of just meeting around your word together. And Lord, we know the power of the authority of your word. We know it's thus and thus saith the Lord. And we just pray this morning you'll take up your word. And we pray, Lord, it'll be a living, it'll be a relevant word. It'll be a word that will bless our hearts. It'll be a word that will challenge our hearts. And it'll be a word that will draw us closer to yourself. Because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles there, turn with me to Ezekiel 36. And as I said, we started there at Proverbs. And we looked at that little thought, Son, uh, give me uh, thine heart. And uh, there was an importance there because that's what the Lord longs. The Lord longs for us to give him his heart. And we went into this little portion here, uh, I suppose, in many ways uh, in Ezekiel 36. And we looked at the reasons why he wants our heart. And we looked, first of all, at the reason he wants our heart in order to exchange it and to give us a new heart. Uh, when the scripture says the old things have passed away and all things have become new. So that when we come to Christ and we trust Christ as our own and our personal savior, there's a wonderful change takes place. And we looked at that little thought of how our heart is completely changed. Our way of life is completely changed. And we look at how the Lord changes us really from the inside out. And he does a great work within our hearts and within our lives. Uh, we looked at the little thought here in verse 25 that once our heart was unclean, we, we looked at it was full of self. In verse 26, our heart was hard, it was stony. And the Lord took that heart. And he gave us a pure, clean heart. He gave us a new heart. He gave us a soft heart. That's the wonderful thing about the Lord is that he completely changed. The old things have passed away and then all things have become new. So he gives us new for old. And that's a wonderful thing that the Lord can do within a heart and within a life. And I trust this morning he's done that within your heart and within your life, that he's given you that new heart, that the old things have passed away and that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The second little thought we looked at there in verse 27, uh, he says, and I will put my spirit within you. And it says, and cause you to walk in my statues and ye shall keep my judgments and ye shall do them. So he wants our hearts in order to empower them. He says here, I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. He wants us to walk in his ways and he wants us to live our lives according to his precious word. And ye shall keep my judgments. In other words, we will keep his word. Our heart's desire and the longing of our heart will be to live our lives according to the word of God. Because God's word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our very path. And the wonderful thing about when we go into the word of God is the word of God longs to clearly lead us and guide us throughout life. And that always leads us in the right path and he will always lead us in the right way. That's the great challenge. He can empower us to live a life that is true and right in his sight. We looked at the idea of the Holy Spirit being the spirit of truth, of life, of grace. We looked at the idea of all the different names that the Holy Spirit has. And then we looked into the idea the Holy Spirit is involved in, in the salvation of precious souls, that he, he strives with sinners. And folks, many times people will say, well, listen, that man was speaking directly to me. No, the Holy Spirit was speaking into your heart and speaking into your life. He convicts of sin. And then he empowers for conversion. That's the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. And then, folks, the Holy Spirit comes in and he lives within our hearts and he lives within our life and he indwells us. And the wonderful thing that the Holy Spirit does is that the Holy Spirit indwells us and enables us to have a life that's real and true and that is led by the Spirit. We looked last week at some of the things the Holy Spirit does. He helps our infirmities. He comforts us. He teaches us. He guides us. He sanctifies us. He sets us apart. All of these things the Holy Spirit can do within the heart and the life of the individual that's given over to him. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is important to enable us to live a Christian life in this world we're living in. And it's not an easy thing to do. 
It's not an easy thing to do. As I said to you young ones, we, we were looking at the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways there in the Psalms. But yet it goes on to say in the next verse, though he fall. You see, the Lord realizes the, the type of individuals we are. All we like sheep have gone astray. That's the simple reality. We have wandered. We, we tend to go astray. That's the simple reality in life. And that's why we need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live the Christian life, to continue going on in the path. One of the things, one of the verses, my favorite verse in Scripture, there is in, is in, in Timothy, and it says, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And he said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me on that day. But not to me only, but unto all them also that look and that long for his appearing. And then in the next verse it goes on to say, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And it's easy to be like Demas at times and forsake the things of God. But the simple reality here within this portion is the Holy Spirit comes in. And he longs to do that work and he longs to lead us on. And he longs to lead us into a new place with himself. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The second, the other little thought we looked at there last week and finished off with, that there's the hindering of the work of the Holy Spirit. And we looked at the little thought that the Holy Spirit may be grieved, afflicted with sorrow. We looked at the thought he, he, he may be vexed walk contrary to the, the plan and purpose that God has for your life. We looked at the Holy Spirit can be resisted. He can be opposed. We looked at the idea that the Holy Spirit may be tempted to deceive the Holy Spirit. And we looked at the Holy Spirit may be quenched. In other words, put out the fire and put out the work and hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. And all of these things can be done. And folks, I've seen, and as I said last week there in closing, the Holy Spirit is necessary within his work. And folks, without the presence and the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit, our labor in the Lord is in vain. And that's why it's necessary to make sure in our lives, don't hinder the work, don't quench the Spirit, because we need the Holy Spirit working within us in the days we're in. As we move on today, I want to look at the little thought of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does give gifts, and I'm not going into these in any, in any major way this morning, but in Hebrews 2 and 4, it says this, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And many that the Holy Spirit have imparted different gifts to. As I was reading through some of the commentaries and looking at it, the, one of the commentators said there was 19 different gifts and offices that the Holy Spirit imparts to the individual. And I want you to turn forward with me to 1 Corinthians. And we read a little portion there in Galatians. Turn back 2 Corinthians, then into 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in 1 Corinthians 12, and really from verse 7 up to verse 11, I want to just read this morning. Because here it's speaking about the different gifts that he's got. Now, one of the commentaries I was reading divided them up into speaking gifts, sign gifts, and serving gifts. But the idea behind it is these gifts are given in order for ministry, in order for blessing, in order to bring help to one another and in the ministry of the work of God. So Hebrew, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, and it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. In other words, any of these gifts we're talking about is to bring profit. It's certainly not to bring loss of any kind. For to one is given by the Spirit a word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, 
to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at the one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, folks, we could spend the full sermon looking at those thoughts and not cover them all. But what I want to say is the Holy Spirit imparts different gifts to the individual. And folks, I don't know what gift God has given to you or any, but all that I want to say is that when we look at the gifts, God does impart gifts. And God gives the gifts, but they're for his benefit. They're for his glory. They're for his honor. They're for your benefit. And they're also for the benefit of the other. Now, sometimes people will take them and they'll, and, and they'll use them in a way that is contrary to the things of God. And that's not for anybody's benefit. And when God gives these gifts, they're to be used for his honor and for his glory and for the furtherance of the kingdom. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give us these gifts and they can be used for the glory of God. And as I go on here, I want to move on really to Galatians. Just turn over to the next portion of Scripture, but the fruit of the Spirit. And many times people talk about the gifts and having the gifts and being able to use them. But I believe one of the greatest things that you and I can have in the work and in the witness of God is the fruit of the Spirit within our lives. And if you go to verse 22 and 23, you will see there are nine gifts or nine fruit of the Spirit here within the heart and within the life. It says love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. And if you divide them up, if you look at love, joy, and peace, they're towards God. Love, joy, and peace is towards God. If you look at uh, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, they're towards our fellow man. And then selfward ourselves, there's the gift of faith, or the fruit of faith, the fruit of meekness, and the fruit of temperance. What's love? It's love towards God and love towards our fellow man. In other words, it, it affects our walk with God. It affects our work before God. And it affects our fellow man. And folks, what do we share to one another? One of the things that it's easy to say from the pulpit is, is that we, we love God and we love one another. That's the simple reality of it. And that's what God is saying here. And that fruit is towards God. And it's shown out to God first, our love for God. And that's why, that's why Peter was asked in the scripture, lovest thou me? He was asked the second time, lovest thou me? He was asked the third time, lovest thou me? And the answer Peter gave, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And the important thing for you and me, do we have a love for God? And do we also have a love for our fellow man? If we look at the, the thought there, we not only have love, but we, we have joy. And the, the idea of joy, we, we have joy towards God. Isn't it wonderful to be saved this morning and to have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ? And folks, that's the real joy that's in our heart because we know that we are at peace with God and we have that wonderful peace towards God. And folks, there's fellowship there between you and between the Lord. And there's fellowship and there's blessing and there's peace and there's joy within your own heart and with your own life. And folks, I know the time I trusted the Lord, the joy that I felt in my heart when I stood to my feet to know that I was at peace with God, to know that I was saved, to know that I was ready for heaven. That's the joy that is talking about here. And folks, sometimes we lose that real joy of our salvation. That's why he says, I will restore unto you the joy of your salvation. Folks, have you that joy of salvation? simply within your heart and within your life this morning. A joy towards God and a real joy within your heart and within your life. The third little thought here is the word peace. And, and we, we need that peace, don't we? We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in his word, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And it's not our own peace, but it's God's peace within our hearts and within our lives. We have a peace towards God. 
And God has imparted his peace within our hearts and within our lives. We know we're right with God. That's why these three fruit at the beginning, they're Godward. They're towards God. And it's our fellowship with God will make the difference as we move down through the fruit of the Spirit. So we not only have love, joy, and peace, but if you go into your manward uh, idea here of fruit of the Spirit, the first thing we have is long-suffering. And folks, the idea is bearing up under the trials and under the tribulations of life. Uh, and folks, many times in our life, we, we go through the trials, don't we? We go through the tribulations of life. And folks, the, these are, these are the, uh, the, the elements that come upon us regularly in life. And that's the simple reality of life. Uh, and and it, it's, 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 our, it's our peace in the midst of the trial. It's our peace in the midst of the tribulation. And folks, it's, it's, it's when that real peace comes into our heart and life, it enables us to suffer and be long-suffering, to realize that God has a plan to realize that God has a purpose, to realize God is working in our lives and maybe working in the lives of others when the trial and the tribulation comes our way. And folks, also, we not only have long-suffering, but we have gentleness. And you know, this is towards our fellow man. It, it, it's goodness, it's kindness, it's benevolence. It is a politeness as one of the commentaries puts it. And folks, it's the opposite of being, of being harsh within our own spirit. And that's wonderful within our hearts and within our lives to know that goodness, to know that kindness towards one another, to know that benevolence towards one another, to be polite to one another. And then the last little thought here towards man is, is goodness. And that's simply love in action. Love in action. It's doing good to others. And I, f I trust folks in, in our lives that, 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 that we will be doing good towards one another, that we'll show goodness towards one another and towards our fellow man. So we have our Godward fruit. We also have our manward fruit. And now we have our selfward fruit. Here in the fruit, it says faith, faith. True religion makes us faithful. That's what one of the commentaries said. In other words, we need to take that word faith and we need to put full on the end of it. Full of faith. Because once we are filled with faith, we are those who are faithful. One of the greatest benefits, I believe, in the Christian life towards ourselves is to simply be faithful. To be faithful. You know, when we think of, of when we stand before God one day, God will say, well done, thou good and faithful. Faithful. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And I wonder this morning, folks, are we those who are faithful? One of the other words I thought put it lovely, dependable, dependable. Can the Lord depend upon you? Can others depend upon you? Can you depend upon yourself? Maybe it comes down to that self word. You know, folks, someone who is dependable, faithful. The second little thought here is, is meekness. And that's the right use of power. And it's the right use of authority. Meekness is power, but it's under control. And folks, when we have that meekness within our hearts and lives, that's power under control. You know, Moses was a man, and he, he put up with quite a bit. But the said of Moses, Moses was a meek man. He was a meek man. And you know, to that meekness, that was the only way he could lead the children of Israel over many years. Yes, Moses, he, he struck the rock in anger. There was a problem, yes. But yet the scripture says of Moses, he was a man who was meek. And I wonder, can the Lord say of you or me that, listen, we're, we're a man or a woman who's powerful, but yet under his control, under his authority, under his leadership in our lives. And then the last little thought here is temperance. That's self-control, self-control. 
And folks, that's what we need in our lives today. We, we need that self-control, don't we? You know, something needs to, in, in our lives needs to, needs to tie us back, don't we? And the Lord needs to keep us back from situations that we may, may rush on into. That's the wonderful thing. That's temperance. That's self-control. And you and I need to have self-control within our lives. And if the fruit of the Spirit is there, we'll be blessed towards God. If the fruit of the Spirit is there, we'll be blessed towards our fellow man. But the fruit of the Spirit is there, it'll bring blessing into our own heart and into our own life. That's why we need the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit, can I say in closing here, that the Holy Spirit empowers us to live a Christian life. That's first and foremost what it needs to do. The Holy Spirit empowers us for service and we need to be involved in the service of God. And the Holy Spirit empowers us for himself to do a work. And we need to be empowered with the Holy Spirit to be enabled to live that Christian life and to be effective in our service for him. And folks, the simple reality here is that he longs for our heart in order that he can empower us. As we move on very quickly, folks, and I know time is moving very quickly here this morning, but the third little thought here, he wants not only our hearts in order to exchange them, to give us a new one. He not only wants our hearts in order to empower them, to fill us with the Holy Spirit, enable us to live the Christian life, but he wants our hearts in order to establish them. Here in verse 28, of Ezekiel uh, 36, it says this. In verse 28, it says, and ye shall dwell in the land. Now, can I say first and foremost here, the primary reference here is to Israel's restoration. And the primary reference here is to, to when the children of Israel will be brought in and brought back into the land of Israel. That's the main reference here. And God is doing that because God has promised to do it. And God is doing that. And right up to this very present hour and this very present day, the Lord is doing that. But can I say for you and me this morning... We can take that message as far as giving our heart to the Lord that he can establish it. And we can use it as a parable if you allow me to do that. And our hearts have been wandering and have been far away from God. The scripture says all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of his all. So there's been a time when we've wandered far away from God. And we've been wandering. And now the Lord is longing to bring us back into a, a new place with him. That he can establish our hearts. That he can strengthen our hearts. That he can keep us in, 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 in the very bosom of himself. That's what he's longing to do. And what God is saying here to you and me, he's saying, give me your heart. And I will come to dwell in the land and I will establish you. That's what he is saying here. Now, the trouble is we do wander. But what does God want to give us this morning? Can I say he wants to give us an established heart or he wants to give us a fixed heart? That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 57, if you want to turn back to it in verse 7, my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed and I will sing and give praise. That's why he said in Psalm 112 and verse 7, he shall not be afraid of evil things. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. And wonderful thing to know in the day of crisis, in days of upheaval, in days of turmoil, in days we don't know what's going to happen next or what we're going to hear next, it's good to have a heart that's fixed, isn't it? And it's good to have a heart that is fixed upon God. There the psalmist also said in Psalm 57 and verse 8, he said, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid. I wonder this morning, is your heart fixed? Fixed on God. I wonder this morning, is, is your heart established? Because that's what he longs to do. He longs to give you a new heart that your heart can be established. 
If you want to turn to Hebrews 13 over a couple of little portions and verse 9, it says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrine, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. The grace of God that not only saves, but the grace which is the favor of God, which wonderfully fixes our heart upon our God. If you go back to verse 8 of Hebrews 13, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forever. Why is our heart fixed? Why is our heart fixed upon God? It's fixed upon God because he never changes. At fixed upon God because he is the same yesterday. He's the same today, and he will be the same forever. There's not one thing we can say in this world that is going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever because it's changing that fast. But we can say it about God this morning, can't we? And our hearts are fixed upon him, and that's why, folks, we have a firm foundation. We're established and wonderfully established in him. My time is gone, folks, but I'm just going to leave the last one with you. He wants our hearts in order to enrich them. And here in verse 28, he says this, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. Here's a wonderful promise, underline it. Ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Now I know it's a promise to the children of Israel, but I believe it's a promise to God's children today. It's a promise to me as his child, and it's a promise to you as his child. You see, there's three things here. There's God's people, my people. That's the wonderful thing, my people. There's, there's, God's, there's God's presence here, your God. He's not saying we're going to be someone else's God, but he says, I'm going to be your God, God's presence with us. He'll not leave us, he'll not forsake us. And then we see, lastly, God's provision. Look at verses 29 and 30 three times. He says, I will, I will. That's the provision of a mighty God. Folks, aren't we an enriched people? We're God's people. We've God's presence. We've God's provision. And he'll not leave us. And he'll not forsake us. Dear